Well, let me commence by thanking Jane for her invitation to speak on such an important topic in, in, in such an important forum, and for Cara and her kind introduction. The Priscilla and Aquila Centre aims to encourage and strengthen and improve the training of women for ministry here at Moore College, especially to encourage, strengthen and improve the practical expressions of complementarianism at Moore College in order to teach and model biblically faithful patterns of men and women in partnership in ministry. I think it is such an important forum to speak on behalf and on behalf of Priscilla and Aquila. I have in my notes here, I don't know if we have widows amongst us, but I've met several already, so I do know that we do. And I'm very glad that you are with us. I don't know that nothing much can prepare you for the pain and grief. There's not much can be said in one sense about the change in life that being widowed creates, especially totally unprepared, as the occasions happen for some. But it's just as painful and difficult for those who go through long periods of preparation and readiness. Our media has a two-week news cycle. Everybody's made conscious of the flood or the fire or the famine, and when it happens, and there's all kinds of offers of assistance, but a year later, they cannot believe that you haven't moved on and solved the problems. Sadly, it's, it's similar with death. The kind of official mourning time of the funeral is a blimp compared to the weeks, the months, the years, the decades of grieving and readjustment that many go through. There are few greater pains in this world than losing one of your loved ones. A child, a grandchild, a brother, a sister, a friend, a close relative, but in one sense, nobody is as close as a spouse. Losing the love of your life with whom you have shared every intimacy, every intimate moment and experience with whom you've brought into life your children, losing the one with whom you've become one flesh can be a pain that is beyond description. Furthermore, reorganising your life after your husband's death and renegotiating your place in society is rarely very easy. It often takes time to even acknowledge that you are a widow. The very word widow itself can seem strange, almost odious sometimes. On Wednesday mornings at our breakfast time, Helen and I pray for our widowed friends. Sadly, as we age, our prayer list gets longer and longer. But they are beautiful women whom it's a delight to remember. But it just is saddened, saddening that we remember them because they're widows. Yet we know the struggle many of them are going through and we long that our Heavenly Father will give them the strength, the patience, the comfort, the assistance that they need in order to joyfully serve our Lord and others. However, tonight I'm not going to explore with you the comforting ministry of, empath of empathising with our sisters in grief. There are many good books and websites with all kinds of helpful advice and tools to assist us to be friends to our sisters in their need. Uh, here are some that I've come across, the First Light Widowhood Association, not a Christian organisation, but about grief and bereavement and supporting Australian widows, the Soaring Spirits International, which is much the same on the American front. There are all kinds of books. Brian Croft, Austin Walker wrote a book, Caring for Widows, Ministering God's Grace. A little book I've got here, Being There, Caring for the Bereaved by John Porter. And as you've heard tonight, Grief Shared with Elizabeth. And this is great news to have it right here in Sydney at Strathfield. And it's wonderful that we're starting up such a thing. And I'm sure there are others of which I do not know. However, it's not the task I've set myself tonight 
and I want to apologise to any who have assumed it would be and will be disappointed because of false expectations. I've set myself the task of understanding the Bible's view of widowhood and seeing the world today from the viewpoint of the Bible. And it only takes a few moments to think of the many references to widows in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there's Naomi and Ruth, there's Abigail and Bathsheba and Athaliah, there's Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, and there's Elisha and the prophet's widow. And then you, in the New Testament, there's Anna and, and, and the prophetess, there's the widow of Nain, there's the widow who just gave her small amount of money into the temple, there's in Acts uh, 6, there's the widow's distribution in the passage we read tonight, 1 Timothy 5, in Acts 9, there's uh, Dorcas providing for the widows of her time, to say nothing of the description of God. For God's concern for widows is that he is the father of the fatherless and the protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. So in God's law, there are great commandments to those who fail. Uh, there's great condemnation, I should say, to those who fail to care and provide for widows or for those who exploit them. Exodus 22, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Deuteronomy 27, cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Indeed, the treatment of widows is like a litmus test of morality. So Job is accused of sin in terms of widows. You have sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless were crushed. But he defends himself again in terms of widows. A few chapters later, if I have withheld anything that the poor desired or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or for from my youth the fatherless grew up with me as with a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. So tonight, it seems a fairly simple task. God cares for widows, and if we're to be God's people, we need to care for widows also, and certainly never mistrust them. It's mistrust. We should never do that. We should never mistreat them. <laughs> but there's many slips of the tongue. But there's much more to the Bible's teaching on widowhood than that. Firstly, notice the unchanging human nature in a changing world. People keep wanting to declare the Bible out of date not understanding that it's not addressed to current trends or particular cultures, but it is addressed to human nature. Human nature is unchanging because of two things in particular. Firstly, because we've all been created by God to fulfil his purposes. And secondly, because without regeneration, we're all the children of Adam, born and raised in sin and under the judgment of death. And yet, while human nature doesn't change, we are living in a fast-changing world. Society and culture in nations like Australia are constantly adapting, seeking to find a better way to live, a better way to deal with the unchanging reality of sin and death. Statistically, widowhood in the first world nations like Australia has changed over the last hundred years. We no longer have a large number of war widows, for example. And the main reason why we have widows in our society is today the fact that women live on average four years longer than men. Furthermore, the economic conditions of widows have changed. The introduction in New South Wales of the widow's pension back in 1926 it's a long time ago, 1926, and yet on the other hand, it wasn't until 1926 that we had widows' pensions. It was replaced by the Commonwealth Pension in 1942 and with more general pensions at the end of the century and the superannuation arrangements. This has gone towards meeting the needs of many widows. 19th century widows, 21st century widows, very different. This is not even to mention the benefit that has come to widows by the incredible growth of the wealth of our community generally. 
However, there are other kinds of changes in our society which affect the whole issue of widowhood today. As a result of the sexual revolution of the 60s and the redefinition of the Marriage and Family Act in 1975, divorce is almost as likely to end a marriage as death. De facto marriages are as likely as de jure marriages, living together as opposed to being actually married. And remarriage has meant multiple widows, wives at, at funerals, for example, and considerable confusion and conflict over blended families. The second wave feminist passion for power and individualism has seriously undermined marriage and family and changed the status and care of widows. But before we look at our first world problems, Christians need to think more globally about humanity and remember that around the world today, widows are still being terribly oppressed. I mean, as a result of missionaries like William Carey and the influence of the evangelicals in early 19th century British politics, we got rid of sati or suti, the, the, the burning of widows on the husband's funeral pyre. But India still has terrible, rep terribly repressive culture for widows. The SBS reported in 2018 that India has about 46 million widows, the largest widow population in the world, but despite their huge number, they remain one of the most stigmatised, neglected and marginalised groups. A town whose name I cannot pronounce is a home to more than 10,000 widows who have either been disowned by their families or who are simply alone. The majority of widows there live on the streets and survive by begging. But it's not just India. The widows of the world are treated appallingly, regularly denied political rights and impoverished. In 2010, the United Nations finally, uh, formally adopted June 23rd as International Widows Day. I guarantee hardly anybody in this room knew such a thing. I certainly didn't before preparation. <laughs> this was in part a response to the 2010 book by the Lumba Foundation, a book called Invisible Forgotten Sufferers, The Plight of Widows Around the World. It estimates that there are 245 million widows worldwide, 115 million of whom, almost half, live in poverty and suffer from social stigmatisation and economic deprivation purely because they have lost their husbands. Sadly, at this point, it is necessary to point out that Australia is not completely free of this financial oppression of widows. In general, the poorest people in Australia are our Indigenous people, single mothers and widows. An Indigenous widow with children is basically in great difficulty. The Australian Human Rights Commission report of 2009 said 58.3 per cent of all age pensioners are women and 73 per cent of those receiving a single rate of the age pension are women. Of all the retired households, single women are most likely to be reliant on the full age pension as their main source of retirement income. Between 2000 and 2005, single elderly female households had not only experienced the highest incidence of poverty compared to other household types, but also have been at the greatest risk of persistent poverty. Around one in three retired women are on the single rate of the age pension and will remain in poverty. In 2016, the ACOS report, Poverty in Australia, reported women continue to be more likely to live below the poverty line, regardless of which poverty line is used. This outcome is due to women tending to have lower employment rates, lower wages than men, and greater caring role both for children and for other family members. There are any number of variations, of course, and differences between people. Gina Reinhart is said to be the wealthiest woman in Australia, possibly the wealthiest person in Australia, and she's a widow. So not all widows are impoverished. 
But there are other concerns about widowhood than just finances. There's also the pain of grief and the changed position in society, both of which involve years of readjustment of life and sometimes are never readjusted. There are any number of different stories of widows in their lives, both in prosperity and adversity, in great joy and in deep sorrow. For some, it's the shock when widowhood comes early in the prime of life. For others, it's the end of life. It's the end of life when there is nothing left but the spouse. For some, it's a matter of economic and social disasters. For others, it's the sad years of caring for the beloved. For some, it's facing raising children, boys especially, on your own. For others, it's facing the loneliness of not having children or any family members. There are just so many different stories and needs, privileges and opportunities amongst widows. But there is one experience that all widows share and makes them a distinct group. It means they can be defined accurately. For a widow is a woman whose husband has died. Widowhood involves then two issues, marriage and death. Understanding this has become a little cloudy today because marriage has become confused by the sexual revolution and today's hedonism. I mean, should we include divorced women as widows? Should we consider women whose de facto husband has died as widows? Understanding widowhood has also changed because feminism has challenged the very concept of marriage. As Julia Gillard said, when I went to university and started forming my political views of the world, we weren't talking about gay marriage. As feminists, we were critiquing marriage. I have a valuable lifetime commitment and have not felt the need at any point to make that into a marriage. Or well, Gloria Steinem wrote back in 1973, we have to abolish and reform the institute of marriage. By the year 2000, we will, I hope, raise our children to believe in human potential, not God. Or Germaine Greer wrote in 1971, if women are to affect a significant amelioration in their condition, it seems obvious they must refuse to marry. Or Andrea Dawkin in 83 wrote, like prostitution, marriage is an institution that is extremely oppressive and dangerous for women. Moreover, even amongst those who rejected this kind of hardline feminism of the second wave, the feminist critique of the suffering of women is built on the concepts of power and patriarchy. Their diagnosis of the problem is power imbalance. Their prognosis is slavery, unless we are able to remove patriarchy. Their prescription of how to deal with this is educational engineering being able to change human nature so that men and women will not be different, but the same and sin and judgment will be done away with. Of course, what it has produced is a permanent victim mentality. Doesn't matter how far we go, we can still complain. Feminism's challenge to the place of women and men inside marriage and the home asks us real questions like, if we're going to consider widows, should we also consider widowers? And what about single people? Why, shouldn't, why should we omit them from our consideration? Isn't their situation the same? Indeed, why discuss widows at all? For men and women are the same, and marriage, and therefore widowhood, is obsolescent. So why are you talking about widows at all? If I have to, I can do anything. I am strong, I am invincible, I am woman. Somebody else said. <laughs> the Bible discusses widows because marriage and death can very often lead to vulnerability. 
which is the opposite of I can do anything, I am strong, I am invincible, I am a woman. But please don't mishear me. Some of the strongest people I've ever met are widows, sometimes elderly widows, terrifying. And as humans created in God's image, women can and in fact do share in ruling the world. In any discussion of the vulnerability of widows, we have to recognise that in some ways it's not universal. As I mentioned a few moments ago, some widows are very wealthy and powerful. But the Bible recognises these differences. You see, within the Bible there are some awful powerful women like Queen Athaliah, one of the most unattractive people ever listed in the Bible, and she was a widow. Others, like the wives of the evil priests in Psalm 78, don't mourn their husband's death. Given what their husbands were like, it was a relief. <laughs> but the issue of widows raises these two important topics on every case marriage and death, of which I think death is the more controversial issue, though most people don't understand. So let's turn first to marriage, point three on the outline. Australian society is confused about marriage and our sexual union. We think we can invent marriage in any terms we like. Now, I'm not just talking about same-sex marriage here, but polyandry, polygamy, de facto, open adulterous, serialised divorce, and multiple remarriages. We can, we can make it up any way we want to. Sexual union devoid of any meaning or relationship or purpose other than pleasure. Using sex casually in hookups as men and women use each other and are used by each other and even abuse each other. Marriage is not a human arrangement. It's not even an act of government. Marriage is a divine institution and more. Marriage is more than a divine institution. It's a divine action. God joins the couple together into one flesh. As Jesus says in Matthew 19, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Marriage is part of God's good creation. For not only did he create us, male and female, in order to multiply and fill the earth, but he also created the woman for the man, the helper who is fit and suitable for him, who is his delight, his joy and his glory. For not only is she human as he is, in the image of God as he is, but also she can be united to him so that together they produce the next generation of children created in God's image and more. They are the co-heirs of eternal life. And so we read that wonderful general description spoken about Adam, who had neither father or mother, remember, but it was said of him, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. It's not just about Adam and Eve, it's about humanity itself. Built into the very creation of humanity was not only the unity of one flesh, but also the diversity of male and female. Downplaying the unity leads to the terrible male chauvinistic abuses of women. Downplaying the diversity leads to the inevitable approval of same-sex marriage. Marriage brings into being children and property and inheritance as two families unite, creating in-laws and also grandchildren and aunts and uncles and cousins. And Now, we might like to think that we are past, past such crudities as children, property, inheritance and families, but one quick visit to the Family Court of Australia and you will see that marriage still brings with it children and properties, inheritances and families. 
Remember, where there's a will, there are relatives. <laughs> Genesis and creation are not the only part of the law to teach on marriage. God's law for Israel had other instructions about marriage than life and the purpose for which God has created us. It deals with just treatment of each other concerning things like children and property and inheritances. But Israel's law reinforces God's creative purposes, declaring, for example, in no uncertain terms, no adultery, reinforcing marriage as faithful, united monogamy. Adultery has always been wrong. The law just articulated for Israel God's abhorrence with adultery, God's creation plan. I mean, remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife, or again Abraham passing off Sarah as his sister to Pharaoh. The law hadn't been given yet, but they knew that such adultery was wrong. Today's Australians embracing individualism instead of embracing their spouse build marriage on the premise of two people. But the Bible starts on the premise of one couple. For the two have become one, for God has joined them. And their children are an expression not of two people, but of one family and is indeed not only the expression of their unity, but the very purpose of their unity. Only death separates those whom God has united, for divorce is domestic violence, according to Malachi 2. The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of, their, of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For a man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Divorce is not seen in our community as domestic violence. But there's hardly anything much more violent than ripping a family apart. Those whom God has joined, let not man separate. There's hardly anything more antisocial than adultery. It is never love. It is always hate. But what difference does the New Testament make to marriage? The gospel doesn't change the concept of marriage. Indeed, Jesus points back to creation and the law in order to explain marriage. And even discussing the marriage of Christ and the church in the heavenlies and the love and submission of husband and wife, Paul in Ephesians 5 refers to the creation account to understand it. But yet the gospel does bring in three clarifications about marriage. Clarifications, not changes. Marriage is for this life only. Secondly, there is discussion of remarriage and singleness because of the gospel. And thirdly, there's spiritual regeneration. Let me take them in turn. Marriage is for this life only. Paul uses marriage to illustrate that the law is only for this life. In Romans 7 we read, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. And Jesus, when talking to the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, if you remember, said, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being the sons of the resurrection. Our reproductive role in creation is over when we come to the age of the resurrection. 
And so our marital unity of one flesh has come to an end. Death is the severance of that special relationship. But sadly, the spouse that is left behind in this world still carries the pain of death and the aching heart of losing the one to whom she has been united in one flesh. However, it does open up the second image, remarriage and singleness. For if death brings an end to a marriage, the widow is at liberty to marry again. She may or may not feel like it, but she's not bound to her first husband. Yet, in the light of the coming of the resurrection age, there are benefits in staying single. While in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul argues for the benefits of remaining single and not remarrying, he does say the widow does nothing wrong in remarrying, provided it is in the Lord, that is, a Christian husband. But he also expresses concern for holiness in two cases. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9, widows who are not exercising self-control should marry rather than burn. And in 1 Timothy 5, he advises that young widows are to remarry, bear children, manage their own households, rather than stray after Satan. But the big change the gospel brings is not to the concept of marriage, but to the believer's hearts. Marriage is not changed, but we are. The law is not changed, but we are. For the third difference the gospel makes is spiritual regeneration. Part of this regeneration by the Spirit of Christ is writing the law of God on our hearts and moving us by his Spirit to want to obey it. This, according to Ezekiel 36, is a key difference between what Jeremiah would call the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The spiritual adherence to the law that Jesus speaks of, say, in the Sermon on the Mount, does not do away with the law, but rather fulfills the law in a variety of ways. The law says no adultery. But you see, the unregenerate Pharisee of every age will try to work out how to appear to keep the law while at the same time breaking it as much as he can. That is the nature of Pharisaism. They do not want the word of God. It is not written on their hearts. They are not moved by the spirit of God. And so they try and find the loopholes, try and work out how you can push the envelope, how you can minimise what could possibly be required of you. In contrast, the regenerate heart rejoices in keeping the law of God. For we want to honour our creator who has joined us together in a way that no man should separate. The spiritually regenerate know that God's way is best. Having repented and renounced our own way of living, we want to know what God tells us to do so that we may put that into operation. The gospel gives to the regenerate an image of how marriage signifies for us the heavenly union between our Lord and Saviour and his church. For he is and models the perfect husband who in love lays down his life for his bride and we submissively united to our head as his bride in the marriage of heaven. So we look forward to the new age even though it will mean the end of earthly marriage. For we look forward to the real marriage of Christ and his bride, the church. And we now reflect that real marriage as husbands and wives, loving and submitting to one another in the image of God. So what are Christians? We're regenerated sinful creatures, that's what we are. Let me take those three terms in reverse order of regenerated sinful creatures. Start with the creatures. 
As creatures, we're still marrying and being given in marriage, still multiplying and filling the earth, still united with our spouse in one flesh. And yet, because we are sinners, we're not living freely and unashamed, naked before each other. And we keep trying to make up the rules for how we should live. And we now harm and hurt each other. And we are dying. And we are fearful of death. As Christians, we're born again. That is, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Forgiven of our sinful abuse of each other, regenerated and transformed into Christ's likeness and therefore seeking to live his way, not our own way. Now, as you can see, what I've said, just said, the world as created is not the world that we live in. Marriage as created is not the marriage we now live in either because everything has been contaminated by sin and now lives under God's judgment, which the Bible calls death. And so we turn to the other side of the definition of a widow, married and the husband has died. Death. Ever since Adam ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have been dead, cut off from the tree, the tree of life. God promised Adam, on the day of which you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And Adam did die that day. All of humanity has been dead since that day. But our knowledge of death is confused by our continued life. We think this life, the life that we live, is life itself, when in fact this life is death. I've likened it elsewhere to being cut flowers. Once you're cut from the garden, you're dead. We may be in the vase and, and in water, growing, flourishing, giving off beautiful fragrance and wonderful wild colours, but we are in fact dead. And if you don't believe it, just hang around long enough and you will see. As we wither and as we gnarl and as we start dropping bits off ourselves and as we finally come to the smell of death in the water. We're dead. It's just a process that's taking a little long. 80 years is not long in the history of mankind. But it feels long because it's the only life we know. <laughs> the only life we know, the Bible would call death. So humans have an ambiguous existence in this lifetime, for we were born dead in our sins and trespasses, in which we live following our master, the prince of the power of the air that is at work within us. Christians are even more complex, for we've been made alive with Christ Jesus to sit with him in the heavenly realms while we await for his return from heaven, when he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. In this fallen state, humans created to marry and procreate are faced with the difficulty of God's judgment. And while death comes to us all, the suffering of our death sentence comes to men and women differently. For man now has to have hardship in his work where the garden is turned into thistles and dust. But for the woman, there is the hardship of her most treasured relationships, pains in childbirth and conflict with her husband. This is more than the labour pains of delivering the baby. It refers to the whole reproductive process which has now been damaged, which leads to hospitals given over completely to gynaecology. We don't have hospitals given over to andrecology but we do need them for gynaecology. And the whole vulnerability of what the apostle calls the weaker vessel when he's speaking of the wife's body. Both are vessels, but hers is weaker. But God's judgment of death does more to us for it highlights the meaninglessness of life. Read Ecclesiastes. 
the stubborn foolishness of sin. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The unwillingness to repent and accept God's word. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Thus we try to explain our lives and ourselves by creating our own cultures, our own mores, our own morals, our own systems of marriage and family life to make sense of what is seemingly a senseless world when everything ends in death. This is progressive Australian inner city elites today, creating the new culture that is going to solve humanity's problem. What arrogant foolishness. But death finally works its way through our bodies and brings the unnatural but normal dissolution to all our relationships, especially that most deep and intimate one of marriage. Death is God's judgment on human sinfulness, breaking the relationship of the human unity that he himself created. Death is the wages that sin pays. It promises to deliver us, but it only delivers death to us. Sometimes speedily, sometimes slowly, but always finally. Death separates us as it moves us from marriage to widowhood. And in the pain of our broken relationships, we get some little glimpse of the infinite pain experienced by God in his son's death. When he who had lived for eternity in perfect unity with his father cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? And when he who had lived for eternity in perfect unity with his father said, it is finished, bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. See, the problem does not lie in patriarchy. It's the solution that lies in the father, the father from whom all fathers are named. It's the solution that lies in the father and his loving kindness for us to experience at even a greater level than ours the searing loss, that pain. Death always means that life is never the same again. At this level, widowers and widows are the same in this regard. Grieving is painful and, and difficult. The pain is as intense as any that we may come across but unlike some other pains, it doesn't go away. And we do remember it. And it keeps coming back to us at the weirdest moments as all kinds of things trigger it once more. At this point, there are many books on how to help widows. There are groups and websites and there's lists for the rest of us on what to say and do and what to not say and what to not do. I read one list of 20 things, 18 I had done that I shouldn't have done. <laughs> and for my widow friends here, I'm sorry. But I've read the book now, I won't do it again to you. <laughs> well, I'll try not to. You see, in our community, there's any amount of care and love on offer, but there's not much actual relief for that pain. It just hurts. I don't know how much care, love and support you're surrounded with, it still hurts and it has to be survived. It hurts differently for different people because our relationships are different. Although we're always one flesh unity, it's still different in different marriages. 
widowhood usually changes two other things, though. Our position in society and our financial circumstances. I say usually because in this world there's an almost infinite array of people and the ways in which they live. Our position in society usually changes because we're no longer part of a team but now playing solo. The invitations we used to receive, the events we used to attend, the activities we used to be involved in, the person we used to sit next to, it kind of all changes. Our financial situation usually changes for death removes the wife's human provider and protector. It often means changed financial circumstances, especially if the husband is still working at the time of his death. But even if he's retired, it usually changes the circumstances. Again, there can be many reasons for this. And one account I read of American widows, for it's noted that this rich country actually doesn't do too well with its widows, it said that without full insurance, the cost of end-of-life medicines depletes the couple's financial reserves, which leaves widows considerably poorer in America than they are in Australia or Britain, where there are health insurances. There's any number of varieties, aren't there? But certainly around the world and here in Australia, on average, widows are considerably worse off financially. Just as a side note, one group that is worse off than widows are divorcees, which is fascinating. It just shows the marriage, family life is still the best social welfare agency that's going. And the great thing, we'll just get divorced, you'll be better off, is actually part of the devil's lies. So having an overview of the two elements of widowhood, marriage and death, what does the Bible say about God and widows and God's people and widows? Points five and six. God and widows. The compassion of God towards those who suffer the consequences of his own judgments on sin is brought out clearly in the frequent references to orphans and widows. He is the father of the fatherless and the protector of widows. The fatherless and the widows, you see, have these two problems. They've experienced the horror of death, God's judgment, but they have now become more vulnerable in life without their protector and without their provider. The two chord uh, uh, string is, more, is stronger than the single chord, but that has snapped. God's compassion for them is brought out beautifully in Luke chapter 7, where we read of the widow of Nain in the funeral procession of her only son. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. The Lord Jesus had compassion on her. But morality is more than empathy and compassion. For when morality is reduced to empathy, rationality is dispensed with, and then justice is denied and social policy becomes folly. Slightly complex sentence, that one. I'll give it to you again. When morality is reduced to empathy, rationality disappears. When rationality disappears, justice is denied. And when justice is denied, social policy becomes folly. Empathy, compassion, really important. But compassion, though very important, is not enough. Compassion and empathy are not absolutes. They are becoming absolutes in the world of identity politics. But they are not absolutes. Few, there are limits. Even to God's compassion, there are limits. Human sinfulness can become so bad that even God's compassion is turned off. 
In Isaiah 9, we read, Therefore the Lord does not rejoice over their young men and has no compassion on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is godless and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Even God's compassion comes to an end. Furthermore, like true faith... Genuine compassion must mean action. Visiting the widows and the orphans in their distress. Indeed, the way widows are cared for is a litmus test of morality. The very epitome of sinfulness in Psalm 94 is that they kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. You want a list of sinfulness? That is really out there as one of the great exercises in sinfulness. So God's compassion for widows in their distress is expressed in his law concerning widows. For once death enters into a marriage, the issue of children, property, inheritance become matters of importance to deal with. And the provision and protection of the vulnerable must be attended to. Broadly, there are four provisions. Firstly, God is her protector. The father of the fatherless, the protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Secondly, the widow has to take on her own responsibilities. She's now responsible for her own vows and financial dealings. You'll find it in Numbers 30, verse 9. And her children are her inheritance, just as it's her children who inherit the family estate. But what if she's childless? This painful proposition for a woman in any age, but particularly difficult in Israel, for then her husband's inheritance in the promised land would cease to exist and her inheritance, her heirs, protectors, providers, wouldn't be available, which is why Jesus had such compassion on the widow of Nain, whose only son had now died. Left without husband, left without children, left indeed. Thirdly, the family must provide for her. Which brings us to Leverite marriage. Now, I discussed this the last time I was speaking on, uh, on Priscilla and Aquila's platform when I was talking on polygamy. So I'm not going to go back down on Leverite marriages again, but it's best seen in the practice of the remarriage of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz was obligated to marry Ruth, as the cousin was who refused to do so, but as Boaz did for the widow, caring for her and protecting her and providing for her and blessed by God with David as his grandson. In Ruth, we also see, fourthly, the whole community must provide for the widow. As Ruth again shows you, she gleaned what the reapers left. That was the law. For in the law, the whole community is to be kind and generous to those in need, knowing God is particularly concerned for the neediest of the needy, the fatherless and the widow. Deuteronomy 24, when you reap your harvest in your field and and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back and get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterwards. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You see, the way in which Israel conducted itself was always with a concern for the provision of the widows because God was concerned for provision of the widows. The whole community is also warned never to treat a widow unjustly or mistreat her, knowing God is particularly concerned for her. Deuteronomy 10, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and the loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Which brings us then to God's people and widows. In one sense, it's obvious that if God is concerned for widows, then God's people should also be concerned. And not surprisingly, we read in James 1, that famous verse, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's in this context that we have 
nearly a whole chapter given to the topic of honouring widows. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, which Cara read for us earlier, is Paul's advice on how to honour widows. We finally got to the text. (laughs) This has got to be the longest introduction in human history. (laughs) Let me summarise it for you and its main points. It makes the point that widows are not all the same. Some have family, some have nobody. Some are self-indulgent, that is given to inappropriate luxury, they're described as dead while alive. Some are young, some have lived as women professing godliness, the good works of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. Next, widows are to be honoured in accordance to their differences. Younger widows should remarry. He is specifically thinking of younger widows who can have children and manage their households. He's acknowledging the sexual, personal, maternal needs of women, something that historical revisionists, especially the feminist persuasion, would never guess the apostle would be aware of, let alone concerned about. But women's needs are real needs and important needs to be provided for. The church should care and provide for real widows who are over 60 and who have no family to care for them and who, who, by their life and profession, are genuine, real Christian widows. Uh, Families, you'll notice, should take responsibility for their widows. In particular, women, in verse 19, are identified as people to be taking care of widows. But notice the strong word to the men in verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? It's not simply women, but men are to be the providers and protectors. Which brings me then to the final topic, husbands, fathers and men in the lives of women because complementarianism is the platform of which I'm speaking. See, Jesus sets up the perfect model of the husband. His lordship over his bride, the church, is not an exercise of power, but of taking responsibility, of sacrificial love, of other person-centredness. Brothers who are amongst us here tonight, when a man dies the community must provide for her in whatever her loss may require. Of course this will be different for different widows, but let it never be said that no man helped, that no man provided. Egalitarianism gives women power. Some wealthy and professional women and widows can provide and protect themselves and good on them. But power is not the nature of Christian living, nor is it a way for a healthy society. Many widows, especially those committed to raising children, cannot easily raise their children and simultaneously make a living. Article after article after article on the pressure of life today working full-time and running a family at the same time. Many widows, especially those who have invested their years raising children or who now are elderly, cannot provide and protect themselves in widowhood. Egalitarian feminism puts increasing pressure upon everybody, especially the vulnerable and struggling who are not the elites living in the inner city with their degrees and their fancy jobs. Complementarianism is based not on power, but on love, on mutual care and on service. Of course it can be abused by power-crazy sinners to oppress, forgetting that God hates injustice and will punish such oppression, but that's not genuine complementarianism. That's old-fashioned, chauvinistic sinfulness. Christian complementarianism would cherish, nourish, help and assist, especially those who are in need. And that would be our responsibility 
and our joy. And if we've ever met all the needs of all the widows in Australia, we should turn our attention to the world, to the millions of those who are still in need, more need even than some of the neediest of Australia. For they have not been met by Christianity nor a Christianised society or a Christianised influence society or social welfare program. But my brothers, there's no need to wait to finish reaching all of Australia first. The world needs the gospel to change the hearts of sinful men now, to care properly like God for the fatherless and the widows. And the first heart of concern to change has to be your own.